Welcome. The talk is Computational Creativity. Could AI be the next Dada movement? Before we proceed, a little bit about myself. I'm a generative artist and a senior student at Ashoka University, India. Apart from it, my interest lies in quantitative finance, full stack web and data science. So these are the points for discussions for the session. We'll be talking about computational creativity, the AI art movement, which I call a new data movement. Then we're going to proceed to literature and poetry. We're going to see how genetic algorithms can show creative systems. Then we're going to proceed to generative techniques like generative art, effective complexity in it, and music intelligence. And we're going to end the talk with generative design. So the main goal is to look at Python as an artistic and visual programming language with the simplicity of beauty of computational creativity. So computational creativity is the use of computer technology to mimic, analyze, stimulate, and develop human creativity. We can say all humans have the ability to produce fiction or new intelligent inventive products, solutions, and techniques. And these creative individuals try to think about the issue in various different ways, examining alternative hypotheses from many perspectives. And they often use analogies to transform themselves into numerous personalities, starting with the vision and running back, believing they are the items being thought about. That brings us to the question whether if computers are able to do the same. So if you look at the domains such as art, literature, food, architecture, engineering, and music, we see computational creativity entails experimenting with the purpose of generating novel ideas and mental processes. AI is frequently used in computational creativity to produce things that are previously thought to be difficult or impossible for computer to generate, such as paintings, sculptures, fiction, music. So, if we put it down in simple terms, we can say computational creativity use computers to achieve outcomes that would otherwise be considered innovative if generated solely by humans. So if we look into academia or research, we see like on the other hand, it allows us to better understand human creativity and develop programs for creative individuals to utilize in which software functions as a, a collaborative tool rather than a simple tool. It has always been difficult for society to accept computers that claim to be intelligent and, that it, and it has been very difficult to accept that they may be creative. So while computers are framed to be uh, famed for their like uh, the mathematical precision and logic, creativity was once supposed to be the realm of only conscious beings. So for many creatives in particular are vehemently opposed to computational creativity. But to understand this further, we need to understand what exactly is being creative. So this is a quote by Michael D'Angelo, which says, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. So being a creative individual means thinking, exploring, understanding and discovering new ideas, and most importantly, taking risk while doubting the fears. So it means like, you do something for the sake of doing something totally different and the ability of thinking independently uh, in some direction of thought to look for opportunities or the knowledge and to maneuvers one inner's uh, cacophony and ride the perceptions and neurological transmissions into one meaningful form of expression so that other people are able to relate to it. So when we talk about creativity, we talk about something which is novel and has some value to it. So this is like a classical view on uh, creativity. Although we can say that novelty is often regarded as defining the attribute of a creative creation, but value is also required because we can say like it's simple to imagine something that has never been made before, but it must have some bring value or it must bring some sort of value. And if we talk in terms of art, it is something which had very complex definitions. The ancient used to believe that God provided inspiration for uniqueness and they created heavenly uh, creatures known as muses to oversee human creation. 
and art had a certain pers uh, purpose and this purpose was usually considered as religious so towards the conception of modern artists where artists began to change this perception as they started signing their own work with the idea that artist has a unique vision so these are those argue we can say these are the those who uh, not only do something or not only believe that something is pleasing to the viewer's eyes can be called as art or the objects that we see around us are all forms of art so these people these uh, specific set of people believe that everything which ranges from laptops to the clothes we wear is ultimately the result of an artist's imagination and cultivated through their individual creativity so this is something the Dadaist movement argued in the 1916 or the 1917s. It was towards uh, the World War One. Even toilets seem to have been categorized as formed of art, as you can see the fountain which came in 1917. But like art, according to the critics, is a journey that we take and is has an ultimate meaning, uh, which is found in act of doing. But like there are others on the other hand which believe that art could be anything, it is everything. And as a counter argument, there is a perception that everything labeled as art is considered to be art. This is because as soon as the mind is taught to do something or to learn to understand something as art, we begin to see and accept it as such. This is something that art historian E.H. Gombrich would categorize as art with a capital A in art. Okay, so uh, however we can say that this idea does not exist in the case of computational creativity, especially those who do not comprehend the inner workings of AI or computation in general. Even in this field, the number of reviewers has increased significantly with artists, art historians and collectors all together contributing to it. This is because to the power, structure and cycle it has risk when it comes to AI creative content. So together we can conclude like as a result, the Dada movement which used to question, which, uh, which not used to, which questioned the traditional understanding of art was born. And for the same reason, it was known as anti-art movement during that time. So the movement is claimed to have had a long term influence owing to a massive impact it had on the general public's uh, mentality. And the movement's central goal was to reject the establishment art forms and the ideals which were in favor in effervescent joy of improvisation and exploration. So in the 1960s, the spirit of the Dada movement evolved into video games and computational arts. And in the 1970s, we saw generative art, generative music and all forms of expression being emerged, laying the way for the 21st century. So there would have been a little likelihood of the arts breaking free of the reforms and driving the spirit of change uh, without the Dada movement since Dada is the movement which introduced the new key perspective uh, that was less about aesthetics and more about meaning and context. So as we can see in the painting fountain, Duchamp toilet seat art sparked a new craze that has nothing to do with the toilet seat but with art in general. So this brings us to the new data movement, the computational creativity. So we can say like similar vein, uh, CC systems or computational creativity systems is abandoning the conventional forms of art. Even without an abstract art world, art was once limited to a limited selection of tools and styles. And AI-based art is capable of expanding beyond the realm of art, such as the de development of uh, 3D portraits, um, as well as the constructions of dreamlike portraits. We can also relate that to surrealism, but that's out of the scope of the stock. And apart from these, we have the profound abstractions, HCI, human computer, human uh, and human art interactions, and more. So these are rejecting the traditional definition of art and giving the realm of art and creativity a new meaning. However, AI is still in the infancy state, just like the Dada movement was. But with the coming of the NFT space, we are seeing a massive growth in the computation creative space. 
So one way we can say that the computers are being creative is by seeing how it works in the liter literature and poetry space. And poet poetry is something is it, uh, which is a type of writing in which words are used to create an image, sound or emotions. And poetry is classified as art since it has its own tone, form, picture and rhythm. So we can say like poetry is anchored in the inspirational and comical, which is a truly human thing, yet it veers towards the computational and algorithmic in many of its manufacturing. <clears throat> that is the reason why it is a real task for a computer to generate poems. And over that period of time, we have seen various state-of-the-art NLP techniques and deep learning techniques include, uh, you know, along with the mix of uh, data mining and pattern matching um, algorithms that we can build and eventually create sonnets and simulate different cards, different kinds of text. But for the sp scope of this talk, uh, I'll be using simple Markov chains that can be used to generate poems and text using a small corpus or even a large corpus of data. Though the results could be uh, quite gibberish at times as compared to using uh, deep learning technologies and the state of art NLP techniques as that would require a much more literation knowledge on the NLP literature research and all. But this will definitely sound like poems by specific poet. So uh, if you Google Markov chains, we'll see a Markov chain is a Markov process. Uh, sorry, Markov chains or Markov process is a stochastic model describing a sequence of possible events in which the probability of each event uh, depends only on the state attained in the previous event. What does it mean? We can say like this works on the principle of memoryless, which can be, in other words, can be uh, the next state of the process only depends on the previous state and not on the sequence of states, unlike other probabilistic models we use in uh, like the n-gram models and all. So it's an arithmetic system that uh, goes through transitions from one state to the next state, which is based on probabilistic criteria. But the distinguishing feature of a Markov chain is that the potential future, cha uh, future states are fixed regardless of how the process got its current state. And let's see how it works with a small corpus of data. This is a a uh, quatrain poem by William Blake. So what we're gonna do is like initially we're gonna take a random word, say it's when, and we're gonna see which words succeed the word when. <clears throat> so the word when is succeeded by my, and then my is succeeded by mother, father, and tell. So we're gonna take a word at random, which is father in case. And father is succeeded by soul, soul is succeeded by me, me is succeeded by while, the yet and my. Then we'll see like my is succeeded by tongue, mother and father. And here we'll again take a word at random and say we can take tongue. So together, this is a new sentence, a new poem, which is when my father sold me while yet my tongue. This sounds quite weird. So let's take another example. So another, when the program is done, it's going to yield something like Yet my tongue could scarcely cry, weep, 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 so my chimneys are asleep. This sounds a little bit. Another one could be, while yet my mother died, I was very young, and my tongue could scarcely cry, weep, 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 weep. And now you might be wondering, like, this is Pai Khan, and why this guy talking about art and poems and a lot of theoretical stuff. So let's see how it actually works in Python. So... Initially, we're going to create a Markov chain function where we, from which we're going to get the Markov chains, which is going to be a dictionary of the words to a list of suffixes. So we're going to pass the file to the function, read it, then we're going to split it into words, create a dictionary of the final output. This is something we're going to get as the Markov chain language. And now what we're going to do is like we are iterating over the length of words minus one till that point and checking if the ith index word exists in the output object, the dictionary we created above. And if it's not, we'll just like uh, add the value inside the nested array so that the final output uh, can have a list of list of values so, uh, succeeding the key and not just one value. It should have multiple values if there are multiple values 
uh, if it's not else we'll just like add the succeeding value to the output dictionary and once we run the function we'll get an output something like this like when is succeeded by my my succeeded by mother father tongue and so on <clears throat> And then we're gonna like do uh, generate a random text out of this Markov chain. So we're going to generate text by passing the Markov chain as the language and the length of the string we want to generate. So we first create the list of keys in the language so that we can iterate over it very easily. Then we will choose a random word as the option and create an empty list uh, as text, which is going to be the final outcome. And then we will iterate over the list length or unless the word is present in the dictionary once we see that the word is not present we'll just like loop uh, break it out of the loop so we check that and if it's not the case then we will go inside the else statement where we just like push the random word into the output and assign another random word to the option and once we come out of the loop we have a cute sentence or a small one we just return the string out of it by joining the array so multiple outputs can be made some of them are here uh, we can go to the third one which says scarcely cry weep weep so your chimneys are asleep and in suit I sweep very young and my father but most of the time these poems are not rhythmic so you can extend this further and use a large data set which is going to yield some better outputs and can generate uh, rhyming words by using something called CMU dict it's a model by uh, in NLTK and this can get the rhyming words and then what we can do is like we can just like instead of moving forward we can move backward into the dictionary and we can generate rhyming sentences and in addition we can also uh, add multiple NLP methods by like speech of tagging so that we can actually understand the works better and let AI decides the choosing the rhyming words in a sentence and then provide us with the rhyming sequences and when we drill deep into the NLP techniques, the model will be much better, the outcomes will be better, and with large data, it will be much more impressive. As the, it's an example which I created using William Shakespeare's sonnets, and it's in, it includes some rhyming words in all. So another aspect is genetic algorithms, which can show like how systems can be creative. So it's a method for solving both constrained and unconstrained optimization problems based on the natural selection process that mimics biological evolution, something we see in the Charles Darwin's book. So with this, we can say that all our lives or all our aspects of our lives are driven by computation and algorithms since childhood, how we learn, how we play, work, etc. All these are driven by computation. So to reflect this, artists are also coming up with this technique to add them into their music generation or art generation, this genetic algorithm, which is a subset of evolutionary algorithm, which is a broader part. So as we said, this is like an optimization technique that reflects the process of natural selection, where the fittest individuals are selected for reproduction in order to produce offsprings of the next generations. So in AI and computation, a genetic algorithm, mostly in mathematics, it's known as the heuristic search strategy, and it's used to find better answers to search issues using the natural selections and evolutionary um, biological concepts. So depending on what kind of a problem we are trying to solve, we can tailor the algorithm accordingly. But this again brings us to a question like, why this algorithm is different from any other classical algorithm so one particular reason is like in each iteration a genetic algorithm generates a population of uh, points whereas a classical algorithm generates a single point of data and a genetic algorithm uses a random number of generators to pick the uh, next uh, population whereas a classical method used a uh, deterministic computing to uh, select the next point with this, you might be wondering why and how this, con this uh, algorithm actually works. So in this relationship diagram, you can see we start with an initial population on the top and so that we can have an initial generation and then we can generate uh, the further generations. Then we have a termination condition. If the termination condition doesn't satisfy, we 
check if the individual is best optimal solution in this termina termination condition if not we just continue further where we select the individuals for the mating process but the thing is like uh, we can't select all the individuals so that so uh, basically we assign them with a fitness value such that the individuals below a specific value would get rejected and we can uh, conceive of dealing with photographs and art in this context for say so the fitness value in this aspect will be derived based on the number of distinct uh, say colors present or the pixel present over there so there are several different selection methods available which are used in genetic algorithm so here we are going to use tournament selections because it might be uh, it might be the best one for the solution in my opinion as it yielded some good results for my case so individuals from the populations are chosen for and forced to find a tournament in this tournament selections and once we find those parents we do a crossover between them and a crossover point is something which is chosen at random from within the genes and then we update the genes and the offsprings are created by exchanging the genes of the parents among themselves until the crossover point is reached and now we have our fit parents we do a crossover between them and as we said it's 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 uh, taken at random so once we're done with the crossover we can go to the mutation and with the new generation we had we can also we don't check for mutation all the time we just like have some specific criteria we just take it at random if some value is shorter is smaller than something then we do uh, mutation because it's very rare it's not always happening so we just like mutate the genes of the offsprings and this way we get the best optimal solutions and in our case it will be the set of sh the shapes that can replicate the original image so this is an image i clicked in portugal lisbon in lisbon portugal uh, it's a place called cabo da roca so i just initially use a set of images and Put a user genetic algorithm to train them and take the shape of the similar image so after some 5000 to 6000 iterations it was able to do this much and if you leave it for more generations it will give you much better results so to understand them in a much easier way so that you all can relate to it we can say let's say a string is there a b and if we ask some humans to like uh, predict this thing by hidden trial it's kind of simpler for them because humans are good at doing the such task but i give you a l much larger text a much larger sentence say jareen yidnap and it's going to take maybe hours to days to months to come up with this string so let's see how we can use genetic algorithms and predict this string jareen yidnap so we start with the initial population we have to generate the random population so each individual here is like a potential solution to the problem we're trying to address so what you're going to do is like we're going to send in the size of the population and the gene size which is going to be equal to the length of the target string and we're going to just iterate over the size and then uh, in the nested loop we're going to iterate over that uh, specific uh, length of the gene size and we're going to append uh, random alphanumeric characters into it and then we're going to append that entire string into the uh, population array and return it. So once we run the, run the, uh, this, uh, the random population function, we will get a uh, array of random strings just like this of 12 characters each. The length, of, length is 12 characters. And then we proceed uh, with the evaluation function, which is a fitness function. So what you're going to do is like we're doing something very simple. So what's happening over here is like we're initializing a fitness of zero and then we are passing each individual value, each individual string uh, from the population array. And then what's happening is like we are iterating from zero until the length of the array and we are get, taking the absolute value of the Unicode values of that characters minus the unicode value of the target of that uh, of the index character of the target value so suppose in its j is our first uh, target character and in our 
this random string it's k we will try to calculate the unicode distance between them and then return the fitness value <clears throat> once we're done with this we will be um, fitting the fitness value and for this we will initialize a fitness list and then iterate over the individuals in the population then we pass the values to calculate the fitness between the individual chromosomes and the target one uh, we don't want to store big values so we try to normalize them between 0 and 1 so dividing the fitness by 1 so, so the 1 by fitness and it's going to give us the normalized value and if it's the fitness value is already 0 then we just got to keep as 1 and once we run the function we will see we will get a list of tuples with uh, the, fit, the the string the <coughs> population string and the, as the chromosome and the fitness value associated with it now we have to choose the perfect mating pairs the parents and then do a crossover and see if check for mutation so how we gonna do is like we are gonna get a random parent for crossover using weighted method so we are just like calculating the total sum of the fitness values of that specific uh, uh, the list of fitness the fitness list we are passing in it and we're just choosing a random value between zero a uniform uh, floating point between zero and fitness now fitness sum once we have that we are iterating over the list of tuples which has your value and the fitness associated with it and if the value the random value is smaller than the fitness we say that's the parent we want to do a crossover with otherwise we start we keep uh, decrementing the fitness from that random value and once we once we reach a point it's smaller than the fitness we say that's the parent we want to work with and once we have those parents we're going to pass those parents to a crossover function where we choose going to choose a random point between them and do a crossover between say first pair the first half of the parent with the second half of the uh, child and uh, so the first half of the child to the second half of the child and vice versa and then we're gonna ch check uh, go like make the child's go uh, check for a mutation if there is some sort of a mutation available so what you're gonna do is like uh, we're gonna check randomly if the value is smaller than mutation rate if it's there then we're just gonna pop out a value in between uh, the, like the from the index uh, from the specific index value and updated with a random character and then together we're gonna just like uh, call this function and turn the population at each stage we are changing the population so we are uh, creating an empty list and once we all run it together we will get our fitter string so we can say like this uh, initial set of random strings eventually converge into during it now so even if most of the code has some sort of a randomness, the artist or the programmer who is developing it may be the source of the originality. However, when we look at the end product, we can see that it has some sort of a potential to surprise the audience. And given that uh, Eureka moment, it doesn't matter who created the art since the surprise in the end is kind of a satisfaction. And as a result, machines might be deemed creative due to the enjoyment they produce or they provide to the audience. So when you think of creativity as dissonance or uh, straying away from one tradition's route, that how can a system that is algorithmic and dependent on what we instruct it to do something creative, and how can't it do something other than that we order it to do? So if creativity is defined in terms of dissonance, then how can a machine or a computer display anything we call creative behavior if it can only do something we programmed it to do? So if we consider the progression of human understanding, we can also see that art and mathematics have evolved. And as a result, the mathematics behind chaotic systems, fractals and other functions could also serve as the foundation of generative techniques in the creative arena. Which brings us to this uh, entire new coming field of generative art which is art created through the use of an autonomous system and it's basically draws vector based shapes on the screen using iterative commands and the majority of the art is inspired by modern art particularly pop art because it's more of a digital art without a any kind of an autonomous system and these autonomous system can range from algorithms mathematical functions natural language rules genetic sequences or even procedural interventions is required otherwise this art will more or less considered as a digital art 
and the randomnesses could be one sort of this uh, autonomous system. So we have three main building blocks, which is the randomness, algorithms, and geometry, which frames our generative art. So to, to, to so talk about randomness, uh, it depends. Uh, uh, it changes from language to language. I mean, various different languages have different random methods, but the main objective is to get a floating point between 0 and 1. And for simplicity, I'm using a processing in Python mode for this presentation for the generative art part. So if we plug in the values of random values uh, over a period of time, we will see this this graph of these zigzag lines and if you try to like um, interpolate some uh, colors in between and boxes we will see that these are very very random and does not relate to each other but before we see any such art piece uh, let's look at some of the aspects of it like how and exactly an artist canvas looks like so this is a canvas which is a 2D, 2D Cartesian plane but each point may be thought of a vector, which is the distance between the two points in this uh, 2D Cartesian plane. So as we can see on the right hand side, we have a Cartesian plane where the point is represented by X and Y. And X and Y holds instructions on how to go from the origin to that point. So we may also employ linear algebra operations and to achieve scaling uh, or linear transformations among other things. Similarly, we have some basic operations in processing where we can simply create a point by calling point and passing the x, y coordinates and we can also do that in the 3D uh, space. We can also get the distance between two points by providing the, 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 the x, y coordinates of those points. We can also create a line. We can change the color of the stroke by calling stroke and passing the color code and we can also add thickness by using stroke, th stroke weight and passing it the value, okay. And if we just like use lines and just random colors, we can create some art like this. They, these uses some simple lines and a lot of random colors and a lot of randomness. Along with some points and uh, colors, we can also create shapes in processing, which is like you can create a rectangle by passing in the parameters like the uh, the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, the width, height, which is CD, and the top left corner radius, the top right, uh, by, by mistake, it's T3, it's TR, by the way. Uh, TL, TR, BR, BL, which is like top left radius, top right, border right, and border left radius. We can also create an ellipse by passing the A, B, C, D parameters, which is like A and B are the, uh, the points, and C and D are the height. And we can also similarly call it, create a square by passing X, Y, the points, and the C as the side of a square. And similarly, if you're just like creating a random uh, art with random uh, width of rectangles and random colors, we can simply call a function. Uh, so the setup is something we are trying to set up, initialize something with a size and background. And then we're gonna draw the draw function works like the workspace where exactly what we're doing. And what, what we're doing is like we are iterating from zero to 700 and when taking a, an iterative step of 10, and 700 is the height of the canvas. So we're getting a point x1, which is going to be the random point between 0 and 500, like the in starting position and the end of the canvas, like the width of the canvas. And the x2 point will be the starting from 500 minus x1. So now we're gonna do is like, we're gonna add no stroke so that there should be no stroke and we're gonna fill it with a random color. So random of 5255 will just gonna give you a random color between 0 and 255, which is going to be a shade of black. And then we're gonna create a rectangle from the starting 0th position to the y position to, to y with a width of y. And the second one will be with end of x1, which is the position we found in the middle. And similarly, we can create another rectangle from starting from that position to the end. So then we're going to have these zigzag uh, lines of rectangles together. It's going to give you some aesthetic views and aesthetic art. You can also work with colors and create something like this. And if you add some more geometrical aspects, we can also experiment with pH monitoring experiments. So these are the experiments I worked on and these all worked on this composition too by Priet Mondrian on the left hand side and you can also see some granular effects like dots on these arts so 
this brings us to something called a Perlin noise or the simplex noise. So Ken Perlin developed this noise functions while working on the original Tron movie in the early 1980s. So he used to create uh, procedural textures for computer generated effects. So he wanted not something random but anything which is coming next should have some sort of a symbolic relationship between the last one. So we can say like, like random number generator that generates a random number between two numbers and has no relationship between the last number produced. This uh, simplex noise show discernible pattern because the number generated are naturally ordered sequences of pseudo number, pseudo random numbers. And even if you on the bottom, if you see the graph, if you plot these values, these are quite smooth and quite similar to each other. Like the point, next point is quite close to the previous one. And even if you try to interpolate the colors between the squares, it, it, it looks quite smooth, quite uh, relatable. And using the same aspect, you can also work with dots, points, and uh, lines to create Perlin noise fields, which has uh, which works on the Perlin noise field. And you can also add this granular effect by creating uh, random points using Perlin noise. And you can extend these things and create something more efficient using a lot of physics. So these are 2D field of vectors and each, is, each one is pointing in a similar but different directions as a neighboring vector. And their velocities are also affected by the vectors itself. <clears throat> so depending on uh, how the particles were drawn during the animation, we can use mathematical mathematical functions like trigonometry and can generate some really cool stuff and in generative art geometry factors and chaotic system plays a huge role because in the production of generative art these systems are very crucial as you can see artists have been using repeated symmetry of geometric shapes to produce form throughout history as seen here by their work even the most crucial component is comprehending numbers and geometry and if you see fractals, these are the most complex mathematical forms of art. And they're never ending patterns. Like if you see the Mandelbrot set, and in the Mandelbrot set, if you, if you zoom in, in the same pattern, you will see it appears again and again, in whatever size it is. And vectors are everywhere from snowflakes to galaxies to cloud formations to broccoli or the flowers in nature. But uh, as you can see on the top left and bottom left, uh, these are the Julia sets, which are the extension of Mendelbrot set only. And if you talk about the chaos theory or the chaotic um, attractors, these are deterministic but un uh, and unpredictable. So this means like a small change in the initial state can result in very drastic change in the final outcome. So that brings us to effective complexity because we may have used the mathematics of randomness, fractals and other things to produce something called effective complexity and computational uh, creativity which implies that we don't want pure randomness, we don't want anything which is completely chaotic so is it, since it's simply white noise and we don't want order because it's too predictable. So we are looking for something in the middle and a mathematical system with just enough behavior to avoid being fully random may be the foundation of creative systems. So Gary Flake discussed the complex, uh, the effective complexity of uh, uh, these uh, creative systems or generative art approaches in his book The Computational Beauty of Nature where he pointed out that regular and irregular creations are simple. Similarly in the works by Philip Gallanter, What is Generative Art? Complexity Theory as a, complex, as a context for art theory it describes like generative art systems in terms of effective complexity and mentioned uh, that art is based on symmetry uh, or L systems or tiling and he proposed that these systems will be more ordered and randomization based like these uh, systems will be more ordered than the randomization based generative art systems and they will be more disordered with minimal complexity. So the most effective complexity is found in creative art systems as based on evolutionary computing which are situated in the middle of the order in the disorder spectrum. 
because you can see in the image you have an order is order compressibility on the left hand side and disorder incompressibility which are inclined more toward chaotic systems so we want something in between which is our effective complexity in art so before we end the presentation i would like to give a small intro about generative music and generative uh, design so generative music in it's like any music in which the compositional process is uh, delegated to an autonomous system just like generative art and these uh, computer composers or these autonomous system interaction in which the composer creates an algorithm or performs a set of op instructions and carried out a specific part of the computational process so as you can see this image is uh, the Mozart musical dice game uh, which employs mathematical patterns and dies to produce music and pre-compose alternatives and this is like one of the first generative music you will see and other than this one of the earliest generative music artist Brian Eno he utilized genuine magnetic tapes and built a type of loop at the end to generate a random looping around so that each musical composition pro produces unique just as the foundation uh, of the fundamental beginning point. In generative music, we use a lot of uh, approaches and algorithms, but to be concise, we can classify them into Markov chains, deep learning, chaos theory, genetic algorithms, agent-based systems, rule-based systems at all. But in the session, I'll be giving you a little intro about three Markov chains, genetic algorithms and deep learning. And I won't be discussing any code, but there will be code in the GitHub repository shared. So the Markov chains are exactly the same as we discussed earlier, which are the stochastic process. And where the probability of the future state is only dependent on the present state. And in music also, it can be done completely similar to what we saw in the example initially for the poems. But we can have uh, we can have a string of chords as the data instead of some normal text uh, the chords of songs and then use the Markov chains to generate new chords based on it and plug those chords into MIDI files and whatever you want to do and similarly genetic algorithms works in a similar way where we need to have a fitness function a starting population and a mixed of alter solution the only change here is like in the genetic algorithms uh, the fitness value instead of a predefined function we use humans themselves to behave as a fitness function an example could be like to reach each generation of the music between 0 and uh, 1 and 10 and then going uh, to the next generation based on it similarly neural nets so this is a very big topic and neural nets has been widely used for generative music production widely and there have been different architectures ranging from the CNNs to the GANs which have been used to employ this. So Peter M. Todd, he employed a three-layered recurrent neural networks to produce monophonic tunes. And this was one of the first generative music pieces to use uh, artificial neural networks. And despite the fact that uh, the interest in these techniques had grown tremendously in the recent decade, when fresh out input is presented, recurrent networks repeat the results of the prior computation, which allows them to encode temporal sequences again and again. So this is crucial when creating melodies, hence it's a common strategy for music generation, especially the generative music intelligence. But with the coming of the GANs in 2014, it has been widely used as well in the generative, uh, gen uh, generative music. And the concept behind this is very much, sim it, it's, quite, it, it's almost the same. Like you train two networks, one creates artifacts that mimic what is learned from the real world examples and the other tries to distinguish genuine and uh, imitation objects. As one neural network improves, the other must improve as well in order to defeat. Even in some neural net cases have been deployed to mimic humans for the fitness functions in evolutionary algorithm. So the last thing I'm going to give talk about is generative design. So it's an iterative design process in which a program generates a set of outputs that meet a set of constraints which are predefined and a designer fine tunes the feasible region by changing the minimal and maximum position of an interval 
in which the program variable meets a set of constraints as I said which are predefined and in order to reduce and augment the number of outputs. So both in the real world and in the constructions of neural net like LSTMs there is generative design and these LSTMs long short term memories are built with formed with the use of algorithms and they have been demonstrated to be far more successful than uh, the traditional long short term memory. So we can say like from architecture to shoe design, generative design have employed in number of industries. Uh, to give you an example, Airbus had deployed a generative design uh, to generate their elements for the inside of the Airbus 320, which has led in a 45% decrease in weight, which lowers the fuel consumption and reduces CO2 uh, emissions. So this entire talk has been based on a research project me and my colleague did and it's available at AIDad.studio. So feel free to go over there. And with on that note, thank you so much for coming to PyCon Thailand. And if you have any questions, you can hit me up on Twitter and chat with me. Thank you so much. See you. Bye-bye. Ciao.